Okay, I start broadcast then. Okay, I just introduce you for the people. I introduce you in Portuguese and you can start, okay? Sure. Pessoal, bom dia. É, fico feliz aqui que nós, nesse dia conturbado aqui no Brasil, nós podemos trazer essa, essa palestra enriquecedora, Dr. Harstrom. Todo mundo que faz cardiologia veterinária com certeza o conhece. Ele é uma das maiores referências mundiais na área, tem diversos trabalhos, talvez seja um dos top 10, 15 que mais publicam artigos na cardiologia veterinária e ele é o investigador principal dos maiores estudos veterinários né, que nós temos para a valvopatia mitral, como o Epic Study e também o Quest Study. Ele aceitou o nosso convite para falar hoje a respeito aí da da nova diretriz que foi publicada no final do ano passado no, no Journal Veterinary Cardiology, a respeito aí de como, como diagnosticar, é, fazer a triagem, o diagnóstico dos cães na fase oculta da carne patia dilatada da raça Doberman. Agora eu vou falar com o meu inglês não muito avançado, vou falar com o Dr. Hardstrong, e ele vai dar início à apresentação. Lembrando que essa apresentação está sendo gravada e depois nós disponibilizaremos ela é, online com legendas em português. Dr. Hardstrong, thank you very much to be Hello, with I'm us. Here. In a, yeah. Thank in you for inviting that's... me. Uh, thank you for inviting me and um, it's an honor to be able to talk to people, although I can't see them or hear them. I'm actually sitting in my living in, in, in my living room right now, and it's it's getting uh, coming close to evening here in Sweden now, and fall is coming. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, screening for dilated cardiomyopathy in, in Doberman pinches. There's a lot of things that happened here, lots of studies to support the practice of screening. And thanks to people like Clay Calvert, who was the first person who started studying dilated cardiomyopathy in Doberman pinches in, in Georgia. And then followed by Dr. Gerhard Vess from Munich, who's done a fantastic job characterizing this, this, the disease. And I think that we are much better off in Dobermans than we are in many other breeds. But before we go to the specifics of Dobermans, I'd just like to start with some background about dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is an inherent disease of the myocardium that results in decrease in myocardial motion or, or the contractility. So the heart moves more uh, insufficiently. It's known that, or at least suspected, that there is a genetic background in, in most dog breeds. And why do we know that? Well, we know that there's a high incidence in certain purebred dogs. Um, the, then the theory is that these dogs are, they have the mutations, they have the bad genes, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they are being born, and then when they are, you know, in, at coming up to middle age, or even can they also occur earlier, they progressed into a vert disease and we can diagnose it. There is one, one interesting form of dilated cardiomyopathy and that is in, in the spaniel dogs and cocker spaniels in particular, in particular where you, you, seem, you seem to have a nutritional component. That is that if we supplement these dogs with taurine, uh, they, they, will, they will improve the clinical conditions. And of course, there are many, many differential diagnoses. So if you look at the, the, the different breeds here, uh, this is a case series from Mike Martin's clinics. Doberman, Boxer, Great Dane, Cocker Spaniel, German Shepherd, St. Bernard and Labrador. Uh, one thing with, with uh, having case series from, uh, from practices is that you have something called selection bias. And that means that you can only see the dogs that come to the clinic which means that there has been a selection uh, before, before the owner decides to come to the clinic. As a matter of fact, it's very difficult to get hold of, of population-based data. There are some, uh, in particular, insurance data. Uh, in the Scandinavian countries, it's very common that, that people, when they buy a dog, they also get a, a, an insurance, both uh, veterinary care insurance and also um, uh, life insurance. And this means then that if the owner wants to claim a refund, 
then he, that person has to report them to the to the insurance company. And here we get access to more population database data. And here we can see the different breeds, the ones that are most likely to do, to uh, develop dilated cardiomyopathy. The highest one is actually Irish Wolfhound. Cavalier uh, don't count because they get myxomatous martyr valve disease. But the next one is Great Dane, Saint Bernard. Uh, Newfoundland dogs, Leonberger, and then comes Doberman. So Doberman, they are they are affected by this disease, but there are breeds that are even worse off than Dobermans. If you look at the difference between males and females, there's an interesting thing. This is also the mortality rates per 10,000 dog years at risk. That's a measurement that you can use when you're comparing different uh, dog populations in this insurance database. Almost in every breed, there is a male uh, predisposition, and that also includes the Dobermans. Um, the, the, the breed where you have the greatest uh, sex uh, predisposition is actually the, the Great Dane, and that's because the disease is, is suspected in that particular breed to be X-linked, meaning then the, the bad gene is on the X-axis. Here is a Doberman. Um, so most commonly, they, these dogs present, they are middle-aged, older dogs. They, some of them will present with congestive heart failure. Some of them will be discovered at, at routine clinics when they have an arrhythmia or a heart murmur. And we know that screening for the disease will result in an early diagnosis. And this is important because of therapy also, because we know we can change the outcome for these dogs. Um, there is a sex predilection, and uh, with the exception of Great Danes, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is, is not sex-linked. It's actually considered to be uh, an autosomal dominant trait. I'm going to come to that in a little while. Uh, but males are more often discovered, and they progress uh, at an earlier age than females do. So they progress more rapidly, and therefore, when you go into a population, you will find males that have more severe disease. So the genetics is that we think that more than 90% of the cases we observe in purebred dogs are, uh, are, um, are genetic caused by bad genes. Certain lines of dogs are often affected and that's why and certain breeds are affected. Almost in every breed uh, it is considered to be or has been shown to be inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. And what does that mean then? Well, it means then that if you have one copy, every gene has two copies in the genome, but if you have one bad gene, one of the two copies is bad, then you will develop the disease at, well, with different severity. Great Danes uh, is X-linked, uh, and then Irish wolf found is also kind of, kind of complicated thing. We're not going to go into that, but it, it's... Uh, it's more, it's, it's a complicated mode of inheritance. And then uh, autosomal recessive trait in Portuguese dog, water dogs. So we usually divide dogs into three stages. We have stage one, then we have the genetic defect, uh, but we can't, dis we discover the disease regardless what kind of exam we do. We have the preclinical stage where we have, we might find abnormal heart sounds, uh, we might hear an arrhythmia, but the, the dog doesn't show clinical signs of disease. And then we have the clinical stage, meaning then that you have a dog that starts showing clinical signs, usually signs of congestive heart failure or, or, or fainting. So there are signs then that relate then to, to left-sided heart failure. And that would be low cardiac output, that would be exercise intolerance, weakness, weak pulse quality. Congestive heart failure will be signs from the, respir the respiration. There will be dyspnea, coughing, arrhythmias. And then you have signs related to right-sided heart failure, which is less common than left-sided heart failure. That will be ascites, pleural effusion, or, or and jugular venous distension. Arrhythmia is very common in these dogs. Uh, atrial fibrillation is the most common for most breeds, 80% of giant breeds, but only 30% of the Dobermans will present with this. Um, ventricular tachyarrhythmias are most common in Dobermans and Boxers, uh, and it is a common mode of uh, syncope and sudden death in dogs when, when the ventricular tachycardia goes into ventricular fibrillation and the dog dies. 
There are also brady arrhythmias, that is a terminal rhythm, the dog is about to die, but that is a less mode, a less common mode of sudden death in, in dogs. So the primary insult for the pump is that you have an uh, increased end systolic volume, but that is not the, what it's really causing. It's actually in, a re, in response to a reduction in the uh, end, to, to an increase in the end uh, systolic uh, measurements. So the systolic function, dysfunction comes first, and then the increase. Uh, in, in the end diastolic volume comes secondary as a compensatory mechanism to the, through the poor contractions. We see eccentric hypotrophy, meaning then the heart dilates, walls don't change that much in, in, in thickness, and that's also compensatory. We have decreased, fra decreased fraction shortening, usually less than 25. Large dogs can have a little bit uh, higher than 20, between 20 and 25 if they, are, if they are calm when you examine them. If they're in congestive heart failure, almost all of them are less than 15%. We will also see mitral regurgitation, and that is something called secondary mitral regurgitation to the dilatation and a large left atrium. So here are some examples of video loops. Up to your left, you have a normal uh, dog. It, you can see the heart in a right peristonal short axis uh, view where you can see the papillary muscles and you can see the left ventricular cavity. Uh, it looks like a mushroom. Down to your left, you have a dog with severe mitral valve insufficiency and you have exaggerated motion of the of the left ventricle and the contractions are, are exaggerated and down to your right you have a dog with dilated cardiomyopathy we have a, where you have a dilated heart that don't contract properly so dilated cardiomyopathy is a disease of exclusion you have to exclude congenital disease other acquired disease other systemic disease hypothyroidism, myocarditis, and if you're in Brazil, I think you should think about Chagas disease. Therefore, in every patient we suspect dilated cardiomyopathy, we always measure troponin because we want to rule, rule out myocarditis. Uh, it's also important in dogs that show signs of dyspnea that you rule out other reasons for dyspnea by taking a thoracic radiograph. That's important for ruling out differentials. The interesting thing with dilated cardiomyopathy, when you do the post-mortem, it's not really the, the, uh, the, uh, what you see when you do macroscopic uh, pathology. The interesting things actually comes when you do the histopathology. This is a normal histological section of a normal myocardium. You can see the myocytes run nicely aligned with each other. Here is an, a, a, a histological section of a dog or of, of a Doberman that has dilated cardiomyopathy, presents with ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And here you can see the blue staining is, is uh, connective tissue, is collagen. And then you see the red uh, stained cells, and if you pay attention, you can see that the cells uh, are unevenly dyed here. So, so the red is in different uh, colors in different places, and that is, that is a sign that the myocytes are dying. So this is a degenerative fibrotic uh, uh, lesions that is characterized by in, in Doberman pinches with dilated cardiomyopathy. Boxers is another breed that has a specific form of dilated cardiomyopathy, and they, their disease is characterized by fatty infiltration. Here you can see there's a lot of white hair in this, in this uh, section from the myocardium of a boxer dog, and that is actually fat infiltrations and fibro fibrosis. And these dogs are, are uh, yeah, and then we have the, the other large bred dogs like St. Bernard, if you take the histo histology here, you can see that then that you have uh, attenuated wavy fibers. So the myofibers are, have a wavy appearance and are separated from each other. And these dogs are more likely to present with atrial fibrillation. So this wasn't the topic of today. Today's topic was Doberman pinchers. And I'm gonna come to that now. Dobermans are, speci are, are different than other breeds because they have a dis specific disease progression. 
Initially, often over several years, they only they can only some of the dogs only present arrhythmias. And about one third of these dogs, they die suddenly. The owner hasn't seen anything, hasn't noticed anything, and the dog just died. Later on, uh, there will be cardiac dilatation, and here is a stage when um, signs of congestive heart failure might develop. Roughly one third of these dogs that have congestive heart failure, they will die suddenly. So sudden death is a common thing in Doberlands. Um, we also have, if you look at the insurance uh, from Sweden, insurance data from Sweden, we can see then that the proportion of dogs, the number of claims per 10,000 insured dogs, gradually increase over years. And this, is a, this has been a source of, of uh, worrying for breeders and also for us veterinarians. And therefore, we have started a, an official screening program. I'm going to come to that in a little bit la later on, because something has to be done. So what I'm going to talk to you about today will be age of screening and screen frequency. I'm going to talk to you about ECG and Holter criteria. I'm going to talk to you about echocardiographic criteria. I'm going to talk to you, briefly mention something about the biomarkers, and then we will continue into prog prognosticators and then end up with genetic testings and where the genetics is, is, is standing right now. So dilated cardiomyopathy in Dobermans has been shown in this paper by Gerhard Vess is a disease that is age dependent, meaning then that the, the, the dogs, uh, the proportion of dogs that you can, that will be diagnosed at a given age increases with increasing age. So you can see then if you look at dogs that are only one to two years of age, only 3% will have dilated cardiomyopathy. Two to four years, you have about 10% and it increases uh, them. The overall prevalence in the, in the dog population, as estimated in this study, is as high as 58.2%, and that is an, 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 a very worrisome uh, number, I would have to say. As mentioned before, there are two phenotypes that characterize dilated cardiomyopathy in Dobermans. One is the one that is dilated. You can see echo changes. And there, here is an, a Doberman down to your right that presents with cardiac dilatation, re reduced myocardial motion, re reduced uh, contractility. Um, the other form that, that can occur in dogs with comparably normal echocardiograms are arrhythmias. And most commonly in Dobermans, we can see ventricular premature contractions. Atrial fibrillation can also occur, but it's less common than, than uh, the ventricular premature uh, contractions or ventricular tachycardia. Um, if you look at different age groups, this is also again from Gerhard Vess's study, uh, you can see then one to two year of age dogs, they, not many of them have either echo changes or ECG changes. But once they get a little bit older, we can start seeing that you, they, they start to have echo changes. Some of them will have uh, ECG changes and, and, and um, some of them will have both. But the proportions increases uh, over, over the, as, as the grow, dogs grow older. So uh, we also know that, also again from Garrett's study, is that uh, females, they have a slower progression than males. That means then that when they start coming up into a little bit higher age, we know that a greater proportion of females, as shown uh, by the bars to your left here, will have will present with arrhythmias only, whereas dogs um, with um, whereas male dogs are more likely to pre pre present with echo changes and uh, ventricular premature contractions. So again, females progress at a slower rate than the males do. So based on these epidemiological data from Gera's group, um, the recommendation, uh, the ESVC screen guidelines uh, that I'm going to come to in a little while, uh, recommends that screening starts from three to four years of age. And it's very important that owners and breeders understand that it's not sufficient to just screen once when the dog is young. They need to screen dogs repeatedly while it is uh, breeding. 
and, and preferably also at, at later age. So ideally yearly screens and in particular males that are being used for breeding should be screened yearly because they are uh, they can have many or more offspring than the females and the females used for breeding and non-breeding that, that can, could be considered every two years. So I mentioned to you that in Sweden we have started an official breeding program and what you need to understand then is that uh, it's very important for a dog breeder to, to register the puppies into the Swedish Kennel Club because they get a registration number and uh, there are not many people that will buy a dog without a registration number. Uh, so an official screening program means then that the breeders of a must follow uh, the recommendations from, they must follow the, the, uh, the rules for the breeding program. Otherwise, they won't get a registration number for the, for the puppies. So our screen protocol consists of, of a couple of things. First, we have owner and dog information. And that means also you have to be able to identify the dog by microchip or tattoo. Then we have a physical exam and five minute ECG part where you have to fill in then how many VPCs you see uh, and if the dog has a heart murmur, how much it weighs and so on and so forth. Then there is, there, there is one part about echo findings um, and then one part for the halter findings. And then eventually the screener needs to come up uh, with a diagnosis, a classification, can class the dog normal, equivocal meaning that it's a gray zone dog, dilated cardiomyopathy or something else. Most importantly of this screening program is actually the signature of the owner up here because by signing here the owner signs a release form so all the screen results go out onto, onto the internet into the uh, uh, public domain. This is exact, accessible to everyone uh, so anyone can go in here and see exactly when a dog was screened and what, what the result was. So I mentioned to you before that there are some screening uh, uh, recommendation uh, for dilated cardiomyopathy in Doberman pinchers. And this, these recommendations uh, were created at the request of uh, the European Society of Epidemic Cardiology. And the panel consisted of Gerhard Westen, my colleague from, from Munich, uh, John Jukes McEwen, Oriel Domenech, um, myself, and Sonia Gordon, and Joe Jukes McEwen. So the ECG and Holter criteria then. Well, first of all, we, we in the screen, um, we recommend that uh, the screener do a five minute ECG. And the reason is of course, to be able to identify and prove that an arrhythmia exists if it's auscultable. For, for instance, detection of atrial fibrillation, that is an abnormal finding and that means that if you see atrial fibrillation, you probably don't need to continue to do a halter to diagnose the dog with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, but the thing is that a five minute ECG, uh, a normal five minute ECG cannot replace a 24 hour halter because the time window you're looking at is only five minutes out of 24, for 24 hours. Uh, but if you see more than one P VPC on, on your five minute recording, that's highly predicted that you have more than 100 VPCs per 24 hours. And sometimes dogs present with hundreds of VPCs during a five minute ECG. So the ones where it's really, really important that they have a holder are the ones that are considered to be healthy. Here you need to do a halter to be able to free the dog from suspicion of dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, the, the cutoffs here is that if you have less than 50 VPCs per 24 hours, then that's a normal finding. If you have between 50 and 300 VPCs, that's a gray zone. These dogs are equivocal and they need to be re-examined and anything above 300 VPCs per 24 hours is abnormal and that, that dog is likely to have dilated cardiomyopathy. 
But there are also other things that you need to pay attention to when you examine the VPCs. And one of them is the coupling velocity. If you have VPCs and you have a very short R, uh, R interval uh, from the normal B to the VPCs, uh, a, a coupling velocity that is greater than 250 uh, per minute, that's a, a, a bad sign. And if you have ventricular tachycardia, a high rate ventricular tachycardia, episodes of tachycardia, that's a bad, bad uh, sign for these dogs. And then, of course, complexity also. If you have multifocal VPCs, that's also a, a, a bad sign. And these things should be mentioned on your screen report as well. It's also, if you see many VPCs, you also need to rule out other systemic disease in dogs uh, that have an abnormal number of VPCs. If you have between uh, between 50 and 300 VPCs in in uh, in uh, in, on, your, on your Holter recorder, you should recheck the dogs within 12 months. We are also, there, we don't really know now, there aren't any studies that look at day-to-day -day variability in dogs with VPCs, and that's a study that I think needs to be done. Uh, we also don't know the relevance of uh, supraventricular uh, premature depolarizations. How many is normal and um, do they do they uh, actually give extra information in addition to the VPCs? Echo criteria then. Well, an echo should be done when you screen them. And sometimes you can actually follow a dog that goes into dilated cardiomyopathy. Here's an example of a Doberman that I examined 2013. It had a normal uh, or co comparably normal uh, echocardiogram in 2013, whereas in 2014 the dog had clearly dilated and, the, and had lost contractility of the myocardium. Uh, what you being, what should be done is probably to use the, the most. It's been also been shown by Gerard West group that the most sensitive test you can do with echocardiogram is to use volumes. Um, I would like you. Uh, I would like to advise you not to use the Tycho's formula that you get when you automatically get when you do your M mode measurements, because it's been shown by our group that if you use the Tycho's formula, you roughly overestimate the volume by 200%. You get falsely high values if you use the Tycho's formula. So don't use that. Instead, what's been recommended in the, in the screen uh, guidelines is that you do the uh, Simpsons modified method of disks. And that is done by that you, you try to get as much uh, of the left ventricle in, into the image from a right peristonal long axis view or from the left apical four chamber view. Then the ultrasound system has a software that allows you to trace the endocardial border in systole and in diastole. You do that separately. So end diastole and systole. And once you traced it, it will automatically divide the, the, the area you have into 20 disks. And by that, the, the, the volume can be estimated both in, in systole and diastole. Uh, there is one little caveat with this, and that is that it's very difficult and it's very common that you have something called apical foreshortening. It means then that you don't, you can't really capture all the volume of the left ventricle in your plane, so you foreshorten the apex and you get you, you get a slightly lower value than the true value. The cutoff in Dobermans, as been shown by Gera groups, is the end diastolic volume is, is um, uh, 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 the end diastolic volume uh, divided then by the body surface area uh, is everything above 95 milliliters per square meter is, is abnormal, and the end systolic volume divided by the body surface area greater than 55 milliliters is abnormal. Uh, you can also see the formula how you calculate the body surface area. Uh, today, in the high-end systems, uh, you can actually do three-dimensional echocardiography. 
and that is a fantastic technique that will develop in the future and here you can actually get two volumes the problem with the technique to use the technique in dobermans it is it is actually extremely difficult to get good acquisitions in in large male dogs that that, that you examine so for the time being and i think for the for the you know foreseeable future i think that we have to rely on the 2D image and the Simpsons method, unless some the other method comes along. There are also cutoffs. There are two different cutoffs that have been described, one by Gerard's group and one by Michael O'Grady. And in the cutoffs, according to Gerard, is that males should not have an end diastolic diameter greater than 48 millimeters, and the end systolic measurement should not be greater than 36. Females have slightly lower, actually should, it should actually read 46, I apologize for that. The left ventricular internal diameter should be less than, uh, less than 46 millimeters and the end systolic measurement is the same. If you use O'Grady, then you, you can use the body weight to predict them. Uh, these are the reference, the upper reference range, the cut of them for if you use the formula and, and, and use the body weight to, for this. You can use that, plug that into your computer, uh, into your ultrasound system if you want to. One thing to pay attention to if you use a fixed um, uh, uh, cutoff is that by doing so, you are actually being slightly lenient to large dogs, whereas, where in fact, you actually be, sorry, we take that again, you're actually being tough on large dogs, whereas you're being lenient on, on, on smaller dogs. So it's been shown here, this is the, the Cornell study where you index the, the uh, left ventricular internal diameter to body weight. And as you can see here, uh, with, the, with the red uh, line there is that if you have a fixed line, uh, you, will be, you will actually be uh, m you know, more uh, you know, lenient in small dogs compared to the large dogs. So that's a thing to pay attention to. There are also some ancillary tests that you can think of. The uh, E-point sepal separation, which is uh, done by the by the M mode. You place the M mode so you can see the motion of the of the mitral valve, and then you you look at the E-point, which is the, the the timing when the mitral valve is opening uh, during um, during the passive filling, and. Uh, that should be less than 6.5 millimeters. You can also study the sphericity, and that is done by that you do an index by, by dividing the long axis uh, diameter, the, the long axis length of the left ventricle, and divide that by the left ventricular short axis diameter. That should be, uh, the cutoff here is 1.65. Then we have the biomarkers then. Can we use them for screening? Well, uh, the one, the biomarker that has been suggested uh, to replace echocardio echocardiography is N-terminal pro-BMP. Um, we know that dogs that have dilated cardiomyopathy, they have increased plasma concentrations. And we also know that if there is a, a, a um, there are differences between different stages, if they are preclinical or if they are clinical in N-terminal pro BNTP. So it's associated with dilatation because it's a, it's a biomarker that's being released in response to cardiac dilatation and wall stress. Uh, the problem with this, uh, to use this as a screen tool, is there is no association with number of VPCs. So you cannot you cannot replace the ECG criteria with this, and suggested cutoff here has been uh, uh, greater than 500 picomol per liter. Uh, and there are several studies that has looked into the internal pro BMP in in dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy. Here's a study from Gerhard Vess that you can that where you can see that dogs that present with VPCs they really don't have higher internal pro BMP. Than, than the, the normal ones, so the dogs that were, were the, at the last exam were found normal. So uh, this has been, it's also been shown by Marco Yama's group that uh, the sensitivity and specificity 
is comparable uh, if you use the N thermal Pro BMP and a cutoff of 500 picomole per liter. Um, and if you combine that value with the uh, Holter um, results, then the sensitivity and specificity is comparable. The problem I see with this is that, okay, you know that the BMP is high, uh, don't might have dilated cardiomyopathy, but you really don't have an exact diagnosis because B and P can increase for other reasons and other heart disease as well. Cardiac specific troponin is another biomarker that has been suggested useful in dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy. This is again a study from Gerhard West that looked at uh, uh, CTNI concentrations in different groups of Dobermans. And as you can see here, the CTNI, yes, is increased in the dogs that have signs of congestive heart failure, but and is slightly increased in dogs that have echo and VPC changes, but for the other groups, it really doesn't, it doesn't change that much. So in this sense, uh, the CTNI is probably not a useful biomarker. Uh, we also know that CTNI concentration cannot replace a holter. The cutoff for CTNI has been suggested to 0.22 nanogram per milliliter. But as you can see here in this graph from Gerard Vest Group, you can see then that the, the, there isn't really any relationship with, with number of VPCs and CTNI concentrations. It was also shown by, by uh, Marco Yama's group that, that CTNI cannot replace the holter. Uh, we know then that if we look at the N-terminal Pro BMP, uh, it is more efficient in, in, uh, in diagnosing preclinical dilated cardiomyopathy in Dobermans compared to the N-terminal Pro BMP and compared to the CTNI. Now, this is uh, something called a receiver operating curve. On the axis, you have um, the, false, uh, the, the, the one minus specificity, and that is the same thing as the false positive rate. And on the y-axis, you have the true positive rate or the sensitivity. And then different cutoffs are being examined. So every dot here on the curves is one cutoff. And for every cutoff, the sensitivity and the specificity is calculated. And then these curves are being created. The way it works is that the further away the line comes from the diagonal, which represents just a random outcome, the more uh, the more the better the test is the, the better the specificity and the better the better the sensitivity is so here you can see that the n thermal pro bmp roc curve is further away from the diagonal than n thermal pro mp and ctni therefore it is a better test so n thermal uh, pro bmp can be uh, used as a surrogate uh, for echocardi echocardiography but you, you should be aware then that you, are, you don't get an exact diagnosis and you really, it's not so easy to stage with the values either you get. CTNI cannot be used, used as a surrogate for Holter, but as I'm going to come to in a little while, CTNI is probably uh, much better in prognosticating. And here we come to the, to the predictors then. Because when you have diagnosed a dog with dilated cardiomyopathy, the owner wants to know a little bit how long this dog is likely to live and if there are any, any findings that, that can give some sort of you know, pinpoint towards the, the, what type of prognosis this particular dog has. We know from the PROTECT study, which was a study conducted in Dobermans with preclinical dilated cardiomyopathy, where dogs receive either a placebo or they receive pimobendan, and the end point was when the dog developed congestive heart failure or died a cardiac-related death. Now these are survival curves, so-called Kaplan-Meier curves, where you have time on the x-axis and then you have the percentage dogs remaining in the study on the y-axis. As you can see here, this looks like stairs almost. And uh, these two lines, the placebo and, and the PIMO group are being separated. And the, the placebo group uh, line is more steep than the pimo Bendon group. It means then that they, have, they, they reach the primary endpoint sooner than dogs in the pimo Bendon group. As a matter of fact, the times, the median time 
uh, was almost doubled in the Pimo Bandan group, and the p value was highly significant. But they can also give some, ex some information here. We know them then that the median time until the dog dies or goes into heart failure, if it's a preclinical dog, will be somewhere between 441 days up to 718 days. So that's a little bit what you can use. What you can use. You can also look at the all cause mortality if you're interested in expected survival times, where again the PMO do dogs lived longer than the the placebo dogs did. Uh, the the times were were slightly lower uh, for the PMO Bandan groups uh, compared to for the primary endpoint. But this gives some sort of pinpoint of, of survival times in these dogs, which I think is useful. Uh, we also know that from Mar from Mar uh, from um, Marco Yama's groups that uh, VPCs greater than 50 per 24 hours predict survivals. Here again is our survival curves for dogs with more than 50 VPCs versus dogs that have li less than 50 VPCs. And again, Median survival times here can uh, give some some point on on expected expect, expected survival time. And thermal pro BMP concentrations greater than 900 picomol per liter predict survival. And as you can see, the lines are separated, and again, median survival times can be calculated from this. That gives information of the prognosis. Recently, Gerhard Vess group did a very interesting study where they used something called a decision tree analysis approach, where basically you make a decision tree and you, you create a model to, to, for what you're studying it on. So here are two different, two different analyses they did. On the top, they, had, they said that, okay, uh, they had all dogs that had greater than 95 milliliters uh, per square meter in left ventricular and diastolic uh, volume divided by body surface area. If they had ventricular tachycardia, that's what VT says, they, they, uh, uh, that was a, a, a significant thing. You see the p-value significant. And then if they had ventricular tachycardia, uh, the, the mortality rates were higher compared to if they didn't have ventricular tachycardia. Oh. Sorry, I don't know what I did. There we go. Um, I need to change here a little bit. Uh, sorry, so I can see. Um, then, if the if the dog had a fast fast rate of all VPCs uh, greater than two hundred fifty. Or, or less than two, 260, sorry. That was also a prognostic thing. And if they received antiarrhythmics or not, was also predictive. So in the end, it turned out that yes, um, left ventricular and diastolic volume, if you have used the, 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 these criteria, is a powerful predictor. If you exclude the dogs that develop congestive, that had congestive heart failure, then something interesting comes in, and that is that the ventricular tachycardia criteria remains, but here CTNI concentrations becomes predictive. So CTNI is not so powerful in in uh, in, in in diagnosing preclinical uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, but it is a variable that gives information about the prognosis. Uh, also, we know then that from the PROTECT study that, uh, that PIMO-BANDAN reduces the end systolic measurement. That's the, that's the most you know, striking uh, echocardiographic finding we have in dogs that are being treated with PIMO-BANDAN. And if we do something called a Cox proportional hazard model, which you can see down, to, down here, uh, you can see that here we look at the, 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 the risk for different variables in a multivariate model. If we take the change in left ventricular internal diameter in systole between day zero and day 30 into the variable and include the baseline value of, of, of this normalized for body size and include pimo treatment, yes, no, this change in the LVDS blunts the treat, treatment effect to become non-significant. These findings 
quite actually strongly speak in favor of that it is the reduction in the end systolic measurement by which pimobendum gives a better outcome. It's also been shown in dogs with mitral valve disease. So I'm gonna wrap this up with uh, saying a few things about genetic tests. Uh, we all want them, but where are we right now? If you look in what they do in people here is that they have this kind of algorithm they work according to. Uh, if you have a, a family history, more than three generations, and you've got more than two family members affected, they will, they will, they will recommend that you undergo some, quite some uh, clinical tests here, including ECG, echo, halter, MR, and then measure biomarkers. Um, if they're sporadic, they will also recommend the same here, non-familiar. Then they will do cascade genetic screening. Then they will go through the all different known uh, genes that cause dilated cardiomyopathy, and they also screen uh, first degree relatives. And then depending on if there are if they are gene positive or if they are gene negative, uh, then then they will either recommend that they go back and do another exam, or they will recommend a clinical follow up every one to two years in children and every three to five years in adults. If it's unaffected person with, with uh, you know, no abnormal genes, then they don't go further. The interesting thing with, with the genetics is that if we look at the most common heart disease we have in cats, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is also a, a, a common disease in people, it is the, the mutation that has been described concerns almost exclusively proteins that are parts of the sarcomere. The, the, the different proteins that's been identified is the myosin binding protein C, is the beta myosin heavy chain, 35% of the cases, and it's, it is the troponin T complex then that has been, you know, where you see, where, we, where you find most uh, mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Dilated card cardiomyopathy seems to be uh, more related to cytoskeletal proteins. And th these proteins are, are, are important then for, for uh, cell integrity. And the ones that has been screened also in human has been, des has been uh, desmin, phospholamban, myosin heavy chain, troponin T, CSRP3, troponin C, actin, laminin AC, delta sarcoglycan, and titin. And so far, uh, it hasn't been shown that any of these uh, mutations lead to dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs. Um, Ten years ago, the European Grand Union granted 10.2 million euros to use dog as a model for human disease. It was called the LUPA project and it was, it was aimed to only look at, at um, uh, genetic diseases. So there were many, many centers included in this. There were different work packages that we had. We have the monogenic diseases, there was you know, meningocephalitis, copper resistance, and certain other diseases. We have different cancer projects. We had neurological projects, we had uh, inflammatory autoimmune, and then we had the cardiovascular, where we had one blood pressure project. This, this project included 600 dogs, normal dogs. We had one with some to smart valve disease project in Cavaliers, and we had dilated cardiomyopathy projects, including Irish Wolfhound, Great Dane, Newfoundland dog, boxers, and uh, the, the Doberman. Uh, many things that you can do, there are many different genetics tests that you can do when, when, you, when you do these things. One is, is something called a genome-wide association study. Um, this is a, a complex thing, but I'm just going to explain to you so you understand a little bit what I'm saying in the next few slides. It works like this, that there are certain uh, SNPs, there are certain places in, in the genome where you have a substitution of one of the base pair. And this substitution doesn't mean anything. It doesn't cause disease or anything at all. But 
it can be used as a genetic marker. And right now, I think the most recent canine uh, uh, analysis consists of about 75,000 such genetic markers. Uh, this is called a SNP array uh, uh, technique test. Then. So basically, you take a blood, you, you take a blood test, you take out some blood from a dog, you isolate the DNA, and then you run this test, and then you, you use 75,000 markers. And the way these markers work is, is like a lighthouse for, for telling us that there is an association where, where that particular marker is, and and uh, the the presence of disease so you can for instance correlate marker with presence or absence of disease and you get a p value for that association so this is called a manhattan plot so every every marker on the different chromosome in a dog are done by are shown here by different colors and every dot is one one of these markers and on the y-axis, you have the negative log logarithmic p-value. So the, the higher up on the y-axis a dot is, the, higher the, the lower the p-value is and the higher the association is. In this particular case, you have a peak on chromosome 13 and you have a significant p-genome value here. So there's an association between these markers and, and that uh, trait that was, was investigated. Now, in 2015, uh, no, 2012, there was a, a study uh, done by uh, Kate Merz and co-workers uh, where they described a splice mutation in the gene encoding for PDK4. It's a mitochondrial protein, and that was, that was associated with the development of dietetic cardiomyopathy in Doberman Pinscher dogs. Um, it was... Mutation was located on chromosome 14, and this genetic test is being offered in the US, but also in Europe right now. So that was a good thing then. Everybody thought that this is the silver bullet. But the problem is that uh, when you look into European dogs, and this is quite a big study done by Gerhard Vess and co-workers, where they looked at this specific uh, uh, this specific uh, uh, protein, the PDK4, they found that there was no association between presence of disease and that particular mutation. But what they also could describe was that there was an, an area on chromosome 5, not 14, where the other mutation was, was discovered, was associated with dilated cardiomyopathy in Dobermans. What the geneticist said with this was that, yeah, there is an association there, but the problem is that that particular location is, is, can be considered as a, a genetic desert, meaning then that it's unknown exactly what type of, of proteins are being coded in that particular place. So that was a little bit sad. Uh, there are Newer things has been recently presented by a Finnish group that they have a, a very interesting candidate gene where they have a high association in these, in these um, genome-wide association studies with a particular gene that, is, that codes for a, a, a very interesting protein. The way it works in these words is that they are very being very, very quiet about the exact protein and location and so on because otherwise somebody else might run them pass them by and, and publish it before them. So I'm, I'm quite convinced that we will see very interesting genetic results coming in, uh, coming out in the, in, in the in form of a publication, probably during next year. And uh, with that, I um, thank you for your attention. This is the sunset in Sweden. Okay. Oh, great, great picture. Uh, people, I don't know if someone has questions to do to Dr. James. Pessoal, alguém tem alguma pergunta aqui? O que queira fazer para o professor James? I have one question re regarding when we have these Doberman pinchers with these arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, which drug do you use? Which drug do I use? Well, the, the, now you come into an interesting area because 
there aren't really any any clinical studies that shows that one treatment is better than the other one. And in fact, it's very unusual that that type of study exists in, in, in terms of when treating arrhythmias. What I would say is that most specialists will consider them, first of all, if a dog only has a few VPC, say, or maybe it has like 300 a day or something like that, and doesn't show clinical signs, it might even have a thousand over 24 hours and doesn't show clinical signs, that dog is, is in my eyes, not a candidate for antiarrhythmics. The ones you want to treat are the ones where you think where you can see accelerated, for instance, VPCs, or the ones that are showing signs of, of you know, arrhythmias like syncopal events. I think many people will will consider mexilitin. Um, uh, there's actually a study going on, I think, right now with mexilitin and Dobermans. Um, other alternative is actually amiodarone. Uh, I, I'm I'm wary of using amiodarone chronically. With, with, because if you're going to treat these dogs, it will be a chronic situation. So my first choice will be mexilitin. And mexilitin in Sweden is expensive? Or? Uh, the, the way it works here is that mexilitin is in Sweden, you can't, you have to import it from the US where it's available as a generic. Uh, Bering Ingelheim, who produced mexilitin, uh, they stopped producing it, So, but there is a generic avail available that you can import. I don't know how much, what the price will be in, 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 uh, in Brazil for that. All right. I we have, we have got questions. I have one question that's not for dogs, but it's about cats. Do you use Pimo Benden in cats with heart failure? Get with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yes, I do. Um, what I do is that I, I, every cat that has feline cardiomyopathy, they can be hypertrophic, they can be dilated, they can be intermediate, or they, they can be restricted. They are, every cat with that, that doesn't have significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction would be a candidate for PEMA abandon. There is a study, a clinical trial has been done, the results has been presented, but they were not really, in, they hadn't really gone through the data properly. So I think that, that, that uh, this publication is also probably kind of going to come out next year. Um, uh, we know from, from case series that cats receive pinobandan, at least they don't die sooner than cats that don't receive pinobandan. And uh, so my, my, I, would, I would treat cats with pinobandan, yes. But the thing is with pinobandan is that cats have a longer uh, half-life with pinobandan compared to dogs. So when I, when I give it to cats, I always try to keep the, lows, the, the dose lower than I would have done for a dog of similar size. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we received some questions. One question is from Dr. Hutneya. She's a professor in Brazil. She's, she did his PhD with Dr. Virginia Fuentes. Oh. His, her, yes, her question is about, is, what do you think about future tracking or speckle tracking? I mean, uh, strength we, and strength rate. In, we, 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 there are, we address these, these newer modalities in the recommendations. And to be honest, I think that, I think that these techniques hasn't really lived up to the, what, the, what, what we thought that they could in, in the, in the, uh, in the beginning when they came. And um, uh, there is also a problem that how we have to rely on the classical ways we we do to diagnose the classical methodology we 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 have when we when we diagnose dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy and what we have now is the volume criteria we have the holter criteria and so on but that means then that you you use standard old techniques uh, and then compare it to a new technique. How can you then say that a newer technique is better and, and discover disease at an earlier stage than the older technique? That's impossible. You must some way, somehow, uh, and this could 
probably happen in the future if we have a reliable genetic test. If we follow dogs that haven't shown signs of disease, they are normal in the standard methodologies we're using, and we can see a change, for instance, in, in TDI or, or speckle tracking variables uh, before the norma, the, the other uh, variables become, the classical variables become abnormal, then yes, then we would be able to say then that, that they are, are better and, and more sensitive and can discover the disease at an early age, but we're not there yet. And I, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Okay, great. Dr. Huchine is saying congratulations for you for the fantastic lecture. She said thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have other questions from Dr. Luciana. She's from Rio de Janeiro. His, her question is, how do you monitor a patient diagnosed with acute DCM by Holter after starting an arrhythmic treatment? So the question is, I have a dog that has a congestive heart failure and severe arrhythmias. No, actually, it's in the acute phase. Yeah, so I have a dog in acute heart failure that has ventricular arrhythmias at the same time. Yeah, as the, is, sorry, we say in Portuguese acute, but in English it's preclinical cardiomyopathy. Oh, oh, so I have a dog that ha don't have congestive heart failure, but have ventricular arrhythmias. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, what I would do is that first, uh, they, they, you know, first we, we diagnose a dog that has to have too many VPCs. As I said, not all dogs with VPCs are candidates for, for antiarrhythmic treatments. As I said before, the ones that are candidate are the ones that have a, 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 a complexity and accelerated VPCs. They are, they are the ones that you have to pay attention to. And also the ones that start showing clinical signs of, of, of the VPCs. They are, the, they are candidates for treatment. So what we do is that we will start the treatment and then we will, will probably, we will probably, we will take the dog back in a week and, uh, and do the halter analysis again. And then depending on what we see there, if there's no change, then we probably change the treatment and then there will be another halter. If we have seen, if we can see a significant reduction in VPCs, then depending on how big that reduction is, uh, depends on then when we will do the the, the Holter analysis again. It, it's, it varies from patient to patient. Okay. We have other questions from Dr. Valeria. She's asking about the the, the use about. She's asking about. She would like to know about the the role of the beta blockers in the in dogs with DCM. Do you use well, beta blockers? Well, the, the beta blockers, if you, if you talk about the antiarrhythmic properties, beta blockers can be considered as an, as an antiarrhythmic in dogs with VPCs, but it's, it's not my favorite drug. And, and also, I think that the non-arrhythmic uh, uh, use of a beta blocker has changed radically, I think. And in people, it's well established that beta receptor blockade is something that you start early on in the disease process because it's been shown that the, the, the prognosis and the survival improves quite, quite substantially. That has never been shown in dogs. Um, in fact, what we have right now is, is a couple of case areas that really don't show very promising results. There's one, there's one case series from my colleague here in Sweden, Anna T. Dorm, and then there are a few other reports done. And the, the problem is also that if the dog goes into congestive heart failure and is on a beta receptor blocker, then, then that's also a problem because you do not, do not want beta blockade in active heart failure. That is something that I think every specialist disagree, agrees on. So I, I have used beta blockade very seldomly in dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. Last year in ACBIM in Washington, I was there and I saw one presentation from people, I believe from Canada, about uh, a study with Dobermans in, in preclinical phase and they used spirulactone and spirulactone did not work with them. 
Mm. The only thing good with Sprolacton was dogs in the, the Sprolacton group, they become more time in in sinus rhythms than dogs with, without Sprolacton because dogs without Sprolacton, they develop atrial fib more quick mm. and more fast, faster than dogs without Sprolacton. Do you use Sprolacton? I, I use Parnolacton uh, not in the preclinical dogs. Uh, they, are, they will they will receive pimobendan and, and because Doberman is a comparably large sized dog that's going to cost the owner quite a lot. Um, I think there's really no evidence that that in the preclinical phase that that Sparnolactone would do anything. But I use it in the clinical phase when the, as as a component of the congestive heart failure therapy. Uh, Pimo will will be there. Uh, in the, uh, in, in, in the clinical phase, I will treat with PIMO, there will be furosemide, um, torsemide sometimes, substitute a little bit of the furosemide with torsemide, and then spironolactone will come onto that. ACE inhibitors are used less and less. Okay. I believe we do not have more questions, and I know that you have a, your mother's birthday. Barry? Yes, my mother's um, birthday is coming. Uh, she's not here yet, but she will be here. You know about mothers, you have to take care of them. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. I'd like to say thank you very much to be with us in your Sunday afternoon, in our Sunday morning. It was a very interesting lecture with a lot of information. And I, I'm happy that, that we can that we could record the lecture and more people in Brazil can see this lecture in a few weeks with the in Portuguese subtitles and everybody can have more information about this disease that's not so good for the dogs but it's always good to know more information more information about it. Mm. Thank you very much and I hope that so we can have more lectures with you in the future. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Yes, so.